to CSI's Constitution Day program on September 17th, uh, 2020. Today we're here to talk about suffrage. It is the centennial of women's voting in America. So today I'll be giving a presentation that focuses on the 19th Amendment. All right. So I want to begin uh, by offering a little quiz on the Constitution for you. You can participate in this and so can the students in my class. I'll give you a little instructions here. Simply take out your smart device if you're in the virtual audience. Go to kahoot.it. Enter the PIN number you see there, 2634558, and then a nickname, and you'll be able to participate in my Constitution quiz. We'll give a few minutes for people in the virtual audience who'd like to dial in, uh, join in, to join in. Very simple, go to kahoot.it, enter the number you see in front of you. Whether you're one of my students on Zoom or live on YouTube. Pass, okay. Nice to have a real student, always important to me. By the way, if you're joining me today and you would like to get a copy of a U.S. Constitution that includes Declaration of Independence and all the amendments, you can find these on campus in the CSI Library, at the CSI Student Affairs Office, or come visit me in my office hours in Hepworth 126, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9 a.m., or Tuesday, Thursday uh, at 11 a.m. Uh, and you can definitely probably get these all the time in the library and student activities until they run out or all year, any day during office hours in my office. I have a hearty supply. I'll give it a few more moments. For those who haven't played Kahoot before, you're going to see a question on the screen when we get started. And then on your own device, you'll see uh, basically colors and symbols that match the answers on the screen. You'll just tap the correct answer. Fast fingers do matter for podium. So answer as soon as you think you know the, the uh, answer. And of course, if you have, if you're one of my students, IDK passcode, uh, if you have one of these on you, feel free to use it. To IT uh, on the Zoom meeting, I think maybe students need a passcode to get into the meeting. Perhaps that was my mistake. My students, if you're having trouble getting into the Zoom meeting, please join us on YouTube. You can find that link in the email I sent you as well. We'll give it another minute or two. any of my students to jump over to the YouTube version. I don't know if we can drop that passcode in the middle of a Zoom meeting. That might not work, but technology this year, right? All right, how about we get started? Anyone that comes in late can join us. The passcode will still be at the bottom and I'll take a few moments after a question or two for new people who join us in the live stream to encourage them to uh, join in to the Kahoot late. So let's get started. Let's test your constitutional knowledge.
Congress has the exclusive authority to print and coin money. Under what article of the Constitution? What article of the Constitution concerns the powers of Congress? Click in. If you're coming in late, you can join us at kahoot.it and entering that password at the bottom of your screen. Ah, yes, Article 1, the very first part of the Constitution concerns the powers of Congress. One of those listed powers, Article 1, Section 8, is the ability to print and coin money, a power exclusive to the federal government. The states can't print their own money. After all, that was one of the problems we experienced under our first Constitution, the Articles of Confederation. Imagine how difficult it would be if we all had different state-by-state -state money and coinage. Ex post facto laws, what does that mean? Ah, yes, false. An ex post facto law is a law that is written and then enforced against people who are already doing the behavior, right? So this is making something illegal and then retroactively essentially enforcing the law against people, something that England was doing to the colonists and which they found to be quite unjust, we probably would all agree. And so they forbid Congress to create laws in this way. Nicely done. The Electoral College has 538 votes. Can we know this from reading the Constitution? If you're joining us just now via the YouTube live stream, you can join in on our game that's opening up this talk. Just go to kahoot.it and enter that pin number you see at the bottom of the screen. 2634558. Yes, it does have 538 votes. How do we know that? We have to dig through the Constitution in a couple different places. But in Article 1 about Congress, we know that the Senate is comprised of two representatives per each person. So that totaled up to 100 today. And that the Congress, right, everyone gets electoral college votes equal to their number of House members. So we add up how many House members there are today, 435, which is actually a number set by statutory law. So that gives us 435. Then we look to the later amendments that gave uh, DC electoral college votes, Amendment 23, gives DC electoral college votes equal to the lowest number any state can have. That's three, together that adds up to 538. And of course, to become president, you have to get a simple majority of that number, which is 271. Hmm. This amendment is famous for another portion of, its, uh, uh, of it, which says that people can't be subjected to cruel and unusual punishment. But another important phrase in it is that people are protected from excessive bail. Hint, it's in the Bill of Rights. Yes, the Bill of Rights, of course, is the first 10 amendments, and this is amendment number eight. talking today about enfranchisement of women, but there are three amendments to the Constitution that enfranchise people. Which one uh, enfranchise people based on uh, race, ethnicity, previous condition of servitude? If you're joining on the YouTube live stream right now, you can get in on our game. There's a few more questions left. Just go to kahoot.it and enter that pin number you see at the bottom, 263-4558. Hint, this happened before women. 
Yeah, the 15th, part of that package of Civil War amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments, the 15th amendment enfranchises a large category of people, race, previous condition of, ser uh, condition of servitude. This was kind of a, in a lot of ways, a bitter defeat for certain suffragists who had hoped that they would be enfranchised alongside African-Americans. Not an amendment often talked about, but think about how this revolutionized our government and the types of services it could provide because now it suddenly uh, had an easy mechanism for collecting revenue. What amendment created the income tax? Great expansion of government can be credited to this. Ah, yeah, come pick up a constitution from me. The 16th Amendment creates the income tax. We're talking about the early 1900s. Article three of the Constitution takes up what topic? If you're just joining us on YouTube, you can get in on our quiz fund by going to kahoot.it and entering that pin number at the bottom of your screen. Ah, yes, the judicial branch. Article one, the legislature. Article two, the executive. And article three deals with the judicial branch. What about article five? I just gave away the top three. My students know I'm uh, always giving away Kahoot answers to the next question, but this time I didn't. Yes, Article 5 deals with the amendment procedures, something the suffragists had to become very familiar with by the time they decided to take a national approach to enfranchising women. Article 5 allows for two different ways to start the process and two ways to resolve the process. We call it proposal and ratification. So it's kind of a choose your own adventure game. Uh, the 19th Amendment is passed through the most typical way that we amend the Constitution. It was proposed and passed out of Congress and then ratified by a certain number of the states. Of course, the original document does not put a term limit on the president. It was something that was done by precedent for a long time. George Washington setting that precedent of two terms. Not long after, FDR served longer than that historically precedent of two terms. An amendment to the Constitution was added to make that precedent law. Not just law, but the highest law on the land. Yes, the 22nd Amendment. Awesome, shifts on the board. Final question. Only one amendment has ever been repealed This amendment and its topic are closely tied to the issue of suffrage, actually. Yes, the 21st Amendment, reversing that amendment that created prohibition. Thanks for participating. Hopefully you had some fun thinking about the Constitution. And if you want to see the source material for yourself, pick up a Constitution on campus this week or in my office anytime. Credit to my student, Alexander, who's here in the room, in fact, with us today. Nicely done. He's been paying attention in class, which we love. <laughs> All right.
So today we're going to be talking about uh, 19th Amendment, enfranchising women, and especially with a bit of an Idaho focus. So let's get into that talk. And if you'll forgive me, I will be switching back and forth a little bit between some video content that I've collected of people reading source documents uh, related to women's suffrage. So we might have a little bit of technology back. The early suffrage movement. The early suffrage movement begins uh, before the country's even founded, in fact. Uh, Abigail Adams uh, writing to her husband, talking about her concerns that women aren't being included at the very founding of the country. We often have conversations in my class about whether or not people at the time, you know, were they just oblivious to the, to the ideas that perhaps women as citizens and have the rights of citizens, were they oblivious to the personhood of African-Americans and whether or not they should be included in this new nation? And we know from historical document that they weren't oblivious to this. You know, the choices they made were probably likely products of political convenience. After all, one of the compromises of the Constitutional Convention was that the issue of slavery would not be taken up for two decades. It wasn't that people weren't aware or had to sit didn't have to sit with the cognitive dissonance of wanting to create liberty and freedom for themselves, but maybe not for everyone. But much like today, there were political realities that kept them from having these conversations at the expense, perhaps, you know, we can judge it from the future, of never being able to write a constitution or get people to agree. Uh, and so we know from historical records like Abigail Adams' letters, like the Seneca Falls movement in the 1840s, that these conversations were alive and well long before action was actually taken on them. I have a couple readings that I'd like to share from you now because I think it's really important to hear source documentation. So now I would like to share with you first a reading of a letter from Abigail Adams to John Adams uh, in the spring of 1776. I'm going off mic and changing to computer sound. So hold for a brief bit of hopefully not too awkward silence. Letter from Abigail Adams to John Adams, May 7 to 9, 1776. I believe tis near 10 days since I wrote you a line. I have not felt in a humor to entertain you. If I had taken up my pen, perhaps some unbecoming Invective might have fallen from it. The eyes of our rulers have been closed, and a lethargy has seized almost every member. Tis a maxim of state that power and liberty are like heat and moisture. Where they are well mixed, everything prospers. Where they are single, they are destructive. A government of more stability is much wanted in this colony, and they are ready to receive it from the hands of the Congress. And since I have begun with maxims of state, I will add another, that a people may let a king fall, yet still remain a people. But if a king let his people slip from him, he is no longer a king. And as this is most certainly our case, why not proclaim to the world in decisive terms your own importance? Shall we not be despised? by foreign powers for hesitating so long at a word? I cannot say that I think you very generous to the ladies, for whilst you are proclaiming peace and goodwill to men, emancipating all nations, you insist upon retaining an absolute power over wives. But you must remember that arbitrary power is like most other things, which are very hard, very liable to be broken, and notwithstanding all your wise laws and maxims, we have it in our power not only to free ourselves, but to subdue our masters and without violence throw both your natural and legal authority at our feet. you'll note there that it is May of 1776. It would be very shortly 
that Adams and others would be writing that very famous Declaration of Independence that my students are reading this week as they begin reading the Articles of Confederation, the Declaration, and the Constitution. So they'll do great on that quiz in the future, I'm sure. But it's true, women would organize, would take action in order to have their equal rights uh, along with men. And in fact, the next clip I wanna share with you is, I don't know if you would call it a parody of the Declaration of Independence, but it is what we call the Declaration of Sentiments. Between the time period of the founding of our country, the framing of the US Constitution, and into the early 1800s, voting rights were in great flux in our country. Uh, it's, you know, it would be way oversimplified to say that the Constitution is written many, many men get the right to vote. And then you fast forward until after the Civil War, the 15th Amendment, fast forward to the 19th women, fast forward to the 26th, 18 to 21 year olds. Now, it really wasn't the case that it was that simple. In fact, historical records tell us that voting rights were an incredible flux throughout the country, especially up and until the mid 1800s. Some places allowed women to vote and then unallowed women to vote, allowed African-Americans to vote and then unallowed it, allowed men without property to vote and then unallowed it back and forth. This is because voting rights is a choice primarily of the states. This is why over time we had to use our constitution and add amendments to enfranchise people. That's because at the Constitutional Convention, the framers really weren't sure and didn't wanna wade into the argument about who actually should have the right to vote. They left it under the 10th Amendment, primarily up to the states to decide who would vote. And so at a gathering in the late 1840s at Seneca Falls, women began to organize their first true organizational level attempt to bring upon their right to vote suffrage. And they wrote a version of the Declaration of Independence that they called the Declaration of Sentiments that expressed using the language of the Declaration of Independence their interest in having their voting rights. If you've read the declaration, pick up this document, you know it essentially has two sections. It has the poetic section that we're probably most familiar with, the portion that goes, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident. And then it has perhaps the more interesting section, which we call the, the list of grievances. These are the, the things that the colonists were upset about that the English monarch and the state of England were imposing upon them. So here in this declaration of sentiments read by social science department chair Shelley McEwen, you will hear the list of grievances that those at the Seneca Falls convention were, uh, putting forth as things that they needed reconciled by men of the United States of America. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one portion of the family of man to assume among the people of the earth, a position different from that which they have hitherto occupied, but one to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes that impel them to such a course. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The history of mankind is a history of repeated injuries and usur usurpations on the part of man toward woman, having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over her. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. He has never permitted her to exercise her inalienable right to the elective franchise. He has compelled her to submit to laws in the formation of which she had no voice. He has withheld from her rights which are given to the most ignorant and degraded men, both natives and foreigners. Having deprived her of the first right of a citizen, the elective franchise, thereby leaving her without representation in the halls of legislation, he has oppressed her on all sides. He has made her, if married, in the eye of the law, civilly dead. 
He has taken from her all right and property, even to the wages she earns. He has made her morally an irresponsible being, as she can commit many crimes with impunity, provided they be done in the presence of her husband. In the covenant of marriage, she is compelled to promise obedience to her husband, he becoming, to all intents and purposes, her master, the law giving him power to deprive her of her liberty and to administer chastisement. He has so framed the laws of divorce as to what shall be the proper causes, and in case of separation, to whom the guardianship of the children shall be given, as to be wholly regardless of the happiness of women. The law in all cases going upon a false supposition of the supremacy of man and giving all power into his hands. After depriving her of all rights as a married woman, if single and the owner of property, he has taxed her to support a government which recognizes her only when her property can be made profitable to it. He has monopolized nearly all the profitable employments and from those she is permitted to follow, she receives but a scanty remuneration. He closes against her all the avenues to wealth and distinction, which he considers most honorable to himself. As a teacher of theology, medicine, or law, she is not known. He has denied her the facilities for obtaining a thorough education, all colleges being closed against her. He allows her in church, as well as state, but a subordinate position, claiming apostolic authority for her exclusion from the ministry, and, with some exceptions, from any public participation in the affairs of the church. He has created a false public sentiment by giving to the world a different code of morals for men and women, by which moral delinquencies which exclude women from society are not only tolerated, but deemed of little account in man. He has usurped the prerogative of Jehovah himself, claiming it as his right to assign for her a sphere of action when that belongs to her conscience and to her God. He has endeavored in every way that he could to destroy her confidence in her own powers, to lessen her self-respect, and to make her willing to lead a dependent and abject life. Now, in view of this entire disfranchisement of one half the people of this country, their social and religious degradation, in view of the unjust laws above mentioned, and because women do the, feel themselves aggrieved, oppressed, and fraudulently deprived of their most sacred rights, we insist that they have immediate admission to all the rights and privileges which belong to them as citizens of the United States. And out of this convention, comes clearly, as you can see, the primary interests of the early suffragette movement, that is uh, winning the right to vote. Women had plenty of other concerns. You can hear them in the Declaration of Sentiments, rights to property, rights to access to college, rights to access to gainful employment, uh, concerns about widowhood, divorce laws, marriage laws, but uh, with a fairly clear voice. They believed that it was attaining the right to vote that would primarily resolve this, the, these many issues for them. And so out of the Seneca Falls meetings begins the uh, first organizations that would come to fight for the ballot. Uh, in 1851, we have the National Women's Rights Convention and born out of that time period and the Civil War are two organizations, the National Women's Suffrage Association, primarily backed by uh, famous suffragettes, Anthony and Stanton, and the American Women's Suffrage Association, Lucy Stone's organization. Uh, in general, they had fairly similar tactics at this point. The movement will split again uh, near the time of the 19th Amendment's uh, passage. But at this time period, the split wasn't so much tactical as it will be later. It was really about response to the 15th Amendment. The 15th Amendment, as we saw on the quiz that started our uh, talk, was the one that enfranchised African Americans, people regardless of race, previous condition of servitude, et cetera. Uh, women suffragettes and uh, the abolition movement were very close uh, to each other. They worked hand in hand for uh, a long time. And after the 15th Amendment uh, did not enfranchise women, there was, as there often is in political movements when uh, something happens, a split in the group. 
those who were uh, very injured by the uh, lack of inclusion of women and the lack of effort to fight to oppose the 15th Amendment unless it included women. And that was Anthony and Stanton's group. They wanted to oppose the 15th Amendment. And Stone's group uh, was for the 15th uh, Amendment, regardless of whether or not it enfranchised women. She, wanted to, she was willing to save that fight for another day. So we see that split there. But spoilers, the movements would reunite later uh, in, the, in the late 1800s. that division, right? The Civil War creates division, right? Women have to put their interests aside for the time being and serve as we see in this image here in various capacities during the Civil War. And then post-Civil War, they deal with that uh, disappointment of not seeing the victory that they thought they were going to be able to achieve uh, when they worked so closely with abolitionist movements for so long. After the Civil War and the breakup in a lot of ways of the East Coast based movement, Stanton, Stone and Anthony, we begin to see a burgeoning movement in the West. Uh, lots of new uh, territories and states are being founded. And for various reasons that we'll hear in some readings uh, in just a moment, there was great interest in enfranchising women in the West. States as they often do in so many movements lead the way when the national government fails to take action. As we know from the Constitution, the 10th Amendment reserves powers not explicitly given to the federal government or uh, banned from use in the states to the states. Therefore, because the Constitution makes no explicit mention of who gets to determine who has the right to vote, the states have great authority under the 10th Amendment to make rules about voting. Uh, even to this day, uh, voting in this country is deeply decentralized. That's why in some states it might be easy and quick to register to vote. You can do it on the day of an election. In another state, you might have to do it 30 days before the election or even 60. Our, our elections are very much state controlled. And it is the 10th Amendment and this ability, right, to have state action on uh, elections and voting rights that allows Western states to begin to make the choice, especially when they're writing their constitutions and becoming states, to enfranchise women. Uh, it was at this time especially a very dim look for a national effort, though later in the late 1800s we begin to see, with lots of success in the West, uh, a revival in the idea of a national effort to enfranchise women. And so, with continuing division within the East Coast national movement and more and more action beginning out West, we see a decentralized approach. New states, new constitution, time to hit the road, the East offering support to those out West, sending their agents, doing ground campaigns to encourage women's suffrage. And, and just in general out West, there's a good deal of interest in giving women power. Uh, it could increase their political power with the East Coast government. It could encourage people to immigrate out West. Uh, it was, you'll hear in the speech that I'm gonna play for you in just a second, that suffragettes argued to men in the West that one of the things that could really help them is if their wives were allowed to vote, then their political interests essentially would be double expressed. So a, a interest there in allowing your wives and daughters to vote. Uh, and it, it was just something that could bring more clout to Western states. So with that, I'd like to share with you a speech by one of Idaho's famous suffragette activists, Abigail Jane Scott Dunaway. She was a child of the Oregon Trail, immigrated uh, from Illinois to Oregon, where she lived and was a teacher, an activist, a uh, editor of a, of a ladies magazine. And she worked for quite a while to attempt to bring suffrage to Oregon. And in some uh, combination of frustration over the situation in Oregon and an interest in moving, uh, that we have some evidence that she liked Idaho because she thought it to be very beautiful. She came to Idaho and began to organize to get women the ballot in Idaho. And in fact, she was a speaker at the Idaho State Constitutional Convention when Idaho was working to write and create its constitution. In fact, she gave a very fiery hour long speech <laughs> 
at the Idaho State uh, Constitutional Convention. And I have for you here just a small snippet of that. This speech highlights several things that were going on at the time. Uh, the interest in bringing immigration out west, the interest in uh, beating back polygamy, which could possibly be uh, legalized in Idaho. Uh, and also not in this direct piece, but the interest in proving, as Dunaway wanted to do, that just because you let women vote doesn't mean they would ban alcohol. That is prohibition. Here I share with you Josephine McDonald uh, from the CSI speech and debate team reading a section of Dunaway's uh, state convention speech. Do this wise and patriotic thing, gentlemen of the convention, and your constitution will be adopted by spontaneous combustion. You will put power in the hands of your wives and mothers with which as a home element they can level the blows of irresistible strength at the demon of polygamy that now menaces their daughters in many sections of the southern and eastern portion of this rising commonwealth. Oh, gentlemen, when you grant us the right of suffrage, we shall be so proud of you and of ourselves that we will proclaim the glad tidings of our freedom among all the crowded states and cities and countries of the east, and by doing so, we can turn the tide of immigration into Idaho. Remember that we ask you, appealing to your chivalry, your sense of justice, and your patriotism, appealing to your spirit of liberty and honor to grant us, as part of the fundamental law, our free, unquestioned right to vote. But if you will not grant us this request, then we pray you, as a compromise with our conscience and with us, to put a clause in your chapter on suffrage and elections proving that the legislature may, at any session, pass a bill extending the elective franchise to women on equal terms with men. Surely you will not compel your wives and mothers under a constitutional law of the state of Idaho, which you have denied us the right to any voice in framing or adopting. Surely you will not compel us to go before the ignorant and prejudiced voting class of men with our hands on our mouths and our mouths in the dust beseeching half-fledged boys who have just attained their majority and have not ceased struggling weak with, with weak mustaches or praying foreign-born voters who cannot speak our language or comprehend the first principles of our free institutions. Surely you will not humiliate us and so outrage our sense of justice as to remand us these persons only to be sent away. When we ask for liberty with a brutal no as has been so often done in older states when we ask these voters to amend their constitutions. You have opportunity to so frame your constitution in the very inception of your government that your picked men of the legislature may be allowed to sit in final judgment upon our plea for ballots. Here we hear many of the uh, arguments out West about suffrage, that it would give more power to men to express their interests, that it would bring immigration to the state, that it would uh, encourage uh, settlement there. Uh, in the specific uh, instance, uh, the Idaho case, Dunaway speaks at the Idaho State Convention asking first and foremost that in the Idaho State Constitution, right at its inception, it be included that women have the right to vote. However, she also makes a concession, arguing that if this is not what you choose to do, we ask then for a special exception that the men of the legislature, that is our elected officials, be able to by simple vote in the legislature at any time, give women the vote as opposed to the normal process of amending the state's constitution to include women uh, as voters, which would have meant, of course, the legislature passing out a state constitutional amendment and then having it ratified by voters in the state of Idaho. Unfortunately for Dunaway, 
the uh, framers of the Idaho State Constitution do not take either of her suggestions. They don't include women's suffrage in our founding document, the Idaho State Constitution, nor do they create a special process for enfranchising women. Therefore, after the state constitution is written, it will, in order to enfranchise women, it will have to go through the regular process of amending the Idaho State Constitution, the same process by which we use today, convincing the Idaho State Legislature to pass legislation and then asking the voters of the state of Idaho to ratify that amendment. And that's exactly what happens. Uh, it's in the third session of the Idaho State Legislature, 1895, that the, uh, um, the uh, proposed amendment for women's suffrage is passed. It's Senate Joint Memorial Resolution number two of that year. And it passes with unanimous consent in the Idaho Senate. So it makes you wonder, right, why just six years later from the framing of the Idaho State Constitution, they had realized they were ready to enfranchise women. If only they had done it at the start. It passes unanimously out of the Idaho State Senate and it passes with gusto 33 to two in the Idaho House of Representatives. And then it must go out to the voters in order to be ratified. And it faced some challenges here. Uh, the challenges, first and foremost, the uh, connection between suffrage and prohibition. Uh, the Women's Christian Temperance Organization. Dunaway had been invited actually at that constitutional convention specifically to speak in order to downplay the influence of that uh, temperance organization. Large portions of that hour long speech that we didn't hear in this section are her making arguments about why women's suffrage and prohibition don't necessarily come hand in hand. So prohibition was a big deal, especially to the silver miners of Northern Idaho who were not interested in prohibition. However, allies, uh, LDS settlers were much in favor of prohibition. And so saw uh, enfranchising women, their wives, their daughters, as a way of more firmly expressing their values and uh, adding the potential of uh, prohibition in the state. Silver miners though were a big challenge uh, at the time because it just so happened that this election, 1896, where the amendment to the Idaho State Constitution would need to be ratified was also a presidential election year. And the presidential candidates were uh, William Jennings Bryan and McKinley. And William Jennings Bryan was a advocate of what is called free silver. That is the idea of including silver all right, as an underpinning of our currency along with a gold standard. And this would have been a great boon to silver miners or anyone involved like Idaho in the silver industry. And so it was of concern to suffrage activists that because Idaho would have such an interest in turning out in order to promote free silver, that all these silver miners and those who had stakes in the silver industry, but were also miners were drinkers and were, not, were opponents of prohibition, that this would likely encourage or bring out people who were likely to vote against suffrage. So it was a great concern that the free silver movement would essentially tank the suffrage movement. Another piece of uh, the Idaho, Idaho story is immigration. You hear in Dunaway's talk about immigration from the East, Americans moving from East Coast states to the West, but another part uh, that immigration played in this story was about Chinese miners or other immigrants, not from the United States, but from other countries that were coming. Uh, there was an argument made by the suffragettes that uh, they should have the right to vote because these immigrants would soon get the right to vote as they became citizens. And this would be a threat to the values of the state and the country. And this was a common argument in other places around the country too, but it's another example of how political convenience, right? Uh, you know, can often make for really nasty choices that people make. The suffragists essentially using immigrants as a, a for, you know, an argument. Are you going to let them vote? Why won't you let us vote? Uh, but the action gets underway. And of course, uh, East Coast organizers are aware of this. They're excited to get involved and hopefully score another victory out West for suffrage. 
So actually the first suffrage office in Idaho is established in Hagerman, Idaho. Very quickly after that, many other offices spring up, especially in, Bo in Boise. And resources from uh, these big national organizations begin to pour into the state. This was often uh, an area of conflict for Idaho suffragettes. Uh, the East Coast approach was uh, often that the leaders in this movement should be society ladies, that they should be very polite, that they should move through normal channels in order to accomplish their goals. And that was a little different than the Idaho tactics. Dunaway herself, kind of a, a loud, outspoken, hearty person, would sometimes come into conflict with the, the East Coast kind of tactics of polite society ladies quietly pushing this interest. But like I said, we would have success. The third Idaho legislative session, the third session of the Idaho legislature passes out that amendment. It goes out for public approval and Idaho voters are savvy enough to separate out the issues of free silver and voting for uh, William Jennings Bryan and the issue of suffrage. Brian does win in Idaho, even though he doesn't win the national uh, vote, right? Uh, President McKinley takes office, so free silver, sadly, doesn't become a reality. But women's suffrage in Idaho does. However, with one little caveat, interestingly, the, the vote about in, in uh, 1896, about 30,000 Idahoans turn out to vote. Very small state, remember? Uh, but only about 20,000 of those actually vote to approve the amendment to give women the vote. And so almost immediately, the success of women's suffrage in Idaho is challenged in the Idaho State Supreme Court. The argument of opponents being there's not enough votes. Only two thirds of those who voted endorsed women's suffrage. This doesn't hold water. The Supreme Court doesn't entertain this idea, but it's an interesting example of this idea that we don't often think about, which is, should there be some minimum amount of turnout or a minimum vote uh, in order for something to actually come into force of law? Uh, I often think about this when I see local elections that have like, you know, 15% voter turnout, uh, but speak for the entire community. But here we see this uh, question of whether or not enough people had chose to vote in that election out of all those who did vote in order to make it legitimate. Uh, we call that practice actually undervoting. It happens all the time. Uh, you know, you mark maybe just president on the ballot and you choose not to vote on the back page for CSI Board of Trustee uh, elections. Flip your ballot over, vote in everything, right? You can always look it up while you're even there at the ballot box, you can use your phone. Uh, so, you know, undervoting, uh, we'd like to see everyone cast ballots, at least I would, in our local elections. And so Idaho passes women's suffrage and like several other states in the West, joins this community of Western states that have approved suffrage for women. Uh, around this same time, unity has returned to the national movement for suffrage uh, and tactics are beginning to change. Long has the dynamic of the suffrage movement been society ladies pushing quietly for change, but slowly but surely the move is beginning to radicalize. And they're using the success of the West to try to convince men in the East and especially in the South to endorse suffrage. So I want to share with you another reading that's about this idea. Uh, this reading uh, is basically uh, a speech given to a Southern gentleman using the example of men in the West giving women the right to vote in order to kind of shame Southern gentlemen and say, you think you're chivalrous, then why aren't you giving your wives the right to vote and men out West, the, you know, kind of scrappy pioneer guys, you know, not the Southern gents, they're giving the women the right to vote, but you guys aren't.
The time is past when there is any question as to whether or not we are to have woman suffrage. Already in 11 of our states and in 28 countries, it is in operation. The question before us now is, which way do we prefer to have it come? State by state, as it has come so far, or all at one time by constitutional amendment? The South has had some rather trying experiences with the vote being conferred upon its citizens by the latter method. With that experience in mind, the question now is, is the South willing to delay so long in this new movement in popular government that it will again have the matter taken out of its own hands? Is it not far better that the men as well as the women of the South recognize that real democracy is at hand? That a real and the first republic is about to be born where government shall indeed and in truth rest upon the consent of the governed, where there shall be no taxation without representation. The South is famed for its chivalry, yet the men of 11 of our Western states have passed them in this race for chivalry, which is based upon justice. A chivalry which says to the women of their households, and I quote, we do not hold you in legal subjection. You must and you shall have every legal and political right which we claim as ours. A country cannot be free with its mothers a subject class before the law, with half of its people political paupers, dependent upon the other half for justice. We want our commissions as lawmakers to come from the homes as well as from the street and the office. We do not want the great principles of democracy to be too small to extend to both sexes. Women stood by our sides and helped to conquer the wilderness. They bore the hardships as well as the men. We refuse to take ourselves alone the best, highest results of the struggle for liberty, equality, and fraternity. End of quote. Is that not a far finer chivalry then it is mere word flattery? Are you willing that Western men outdo you? Surpass the Southern men in justice, courtesy, and respect for the women of their states? Have you Southern men less confidence to repose in the mothers who bore you, the wives who bear your children, the daughters of whom you are so proud, than have the men of Illinois or California or Colorado? Are you willing that your women shall appeal in vain to you for citizenship? for self-government and that they'll re receive it at the hands of men more just than you through constitutional amendment? Is it not far better that you put your own house in order? Will this not ensure to you the gratitude, cooperation of the new citizens far more surely than any other way? I can assure you that the Western women are almost as proud of their men for having given them the franchise without a serious struggle by them to secure it as they are of their new dignity of citizenship itself. These men never fail to express their belief and knowledge that it has worked for good and only good to their states. And you must remember that it is no longer an experiment in some of them. In Colorado, the most populous of them, where women have been voters for so long, 20 years, as to make it beyond question a good test. A state where there are large cities and vast wealth, it is the universal testimony of public men that the votes and the help of women have been of inestimable value in bringing to that state the high civilization to which it has attained. These men have found the advice, the insight, and the cooperation of the women of the state invaluable. And it has done something even finer than this. It has made of these men and women real friends, real comrades. They respect each other. They trust each other in a better and finer sense. They realize that they are equally responsible for the defects of their government. The winner, women are not resentful or petty in their judgments, holding the men to account for all the wrongs and mistakes and holding themselves as judges after the fact, without responsibility and without understanding of the needs, the difficulties and the possible remedies. They work together for the things they want, 
If they find they have made a mistake, they work together to correct it. This leaves no place for sex antagonism. It enlarges the outlook of the women. It makes them realize that the price of liberty is eternal vigilance and that the governing of a city or a state is simply a larger homemaking. For after all, what is the state and the city but your home? That's a great line. What, what is the state and city but your home? And so a little bit more on the late suffrage movement, uh, the legacy and the move into the 19th Amendment. After Idaho passes its constitutional amendment, uh, the movement at a national level really gets underway. Uh, you can see there that last piece from 1913, a full seven years before women are fully enfranchised. But by this time period, uh, a national movement is fully underway. Suffragettes are organizing in all parts of the country in order to bring uh, a national amendment forward. This is also the time period where we see a division in tactics in the movement uh, between those who more traditionally Stanton and Anthony's movement, and then uh, the group that would later be called the Iron Jawed Angels, uh, led by people like uh, Alice Paul, for example. They would go to England, see the suffrage movement there, and become radicalized by their tactics of sit-ins and uh, hunger strikes, for example. And these would be the women that would uh, tie themselves right to the gates of the White House, be arrested and, and force fed in prison. So we get both, you know, like movements still today, the, the more, you know, quiet insider tactics and the more radical outsider tactics. And the movement moves forward, winning victories state after state, convincing Congress to pass the constitutional amendment, and then onto that path of ratification state by state. The last state to ratify the 19th amendment in uh, late summer of 1920 is Tennessee. And now I wanna share with you a reading by our board of trustee member, Anna Scholes and her daughter, Mia. They put together actually with the reading I provided them an excellent little presentation. This is a great piece. I, I found it, I, uh, I might recommend to you uh, a reading. This just came out in August uh, from the Library of America. It's a uh, collection of source documents. You can tell it's part of my inspiration here. A collection of source documents uh, related to suffrage starting you know, before we were a country and going through the uh, uh, early 1960s. So hopefully they'll be coming out with a second volume perhaps. Uh, and this next piece, which is called A Perfect Moment, really can only be, I looked everywhere for another way to find this. Uh, the only thing I could find was uh, references in libraries to where you can physically find uh, some copies of this document. But uh, this is a recollection of that day uh, when uh, the, um, the actual document was taken from Tennessee uh, to Washington, D.C. to be certified. The piece is called A Perfect Moment. And again, Anna and Mia did an amazing job putting this together. The last hope of getting a 36th state in time for women to vote in the presidential election of 1920 rested then in Tennessee. Mrs. Carrie Chapman, Cat, who had gone to Tennessee on June 15th with the idea of expediting the preparations, stayed on through the devastating heat of the intervening weeks because she realized how relentless the opposition had become and how unscrupulous its tactics were likely to be. Her insight proved prophetic. For every known or imagined device for preventing or delaying a favorable vote was tried during the 12 days of the special session. In spite of the excitement, Mrs. Catt held resolutely to her conviction that her presence during the legislative session debates would be an almost unbearable strain with no corresponding advantage for the cause. 
but through the open windows of her room in a nearby hotel, she could often hear cheers and applause without knowing until some of the suffrage workers came to report which side was ahead. Although the resolution for ratification passed the Senate with comparatively little difficulty, the struggle in the House was marked by a long series of dramatic surprises in which first one side and then the other appeared to have the upper hand. Even when a vote of 49 in favor to 47 against was taken on August 18th, a motion to reconsider held up the decision for three days longer, during which 38 opposed legislators tried the trick, at the time a novel one, of fleeing to a neighboring state in the hope of preventing a quorum. When that device failed and reconsideration was voted down on August 21st, the Speaker of the House, who was the floor leader of the opposition, announced an injunction against forwarding the certificate of ratification to Washington had been issued by one of the judges of the state Supreme Court. Two days were spent by the suffrages in getting the injunction dissolved. And on the 24th, the certificate was signed by the governor and started on its way to Washington. At four o'clock in the morning of August 26, the certificate from Senate Tennessee reached Washington, and the Solicitor General, who had sat up all night waiting for it, made the examination needed before the signature of the Secretary of State could be affixed. Shortly after eight that same morning, Mrs. Catt, on her way back from Tennessee, arrived in Washington, and the first thing she did was to telephone the office of the Secretary of State. Mrs. Harriet Taylor Upton and I were in the room with her, and heard her ask him whether the Tennessee certificate had been received. In a moment, she put down the telephone, turned to us and said, the secretary has signed the proclamation and he wants us to go over to his office and see it before he sends it out. So quietly as that, we learned that the last step in the enfranchisement of women in the United States had been taken and the struggle of more than 70 years brought to a successful end. We were all too stunned to make any comment until we were in the cab on our way to the Department of State, where we almost had to stick pins into ourselves to realize that the simple document at which we were looking was, in reality, the long-sought charter of liberty for the women of this country. I love that phrase. They almost had to stick pins in themselves. Uh, I've pared down all of these readings quite a bit, but one of the images you saw there that the schools chose to include was of Mrs. Cat receiving flowers. And in fact, the, the full reading of A Perfect Moment describes how at every train stop uh, on their way to uh, Washington, D.C., uh, there were uh, supporters, suffragettes waiting, and they continuously bestowed on uh, Mrs. Cat and the others flowers of congratulations, and you see her in that image holding all of those flowers. And of course, uh, this story, right, so many of it from the on the ground organizing to the tactical uh, contentions, to the splits in the movement, uh, to the tactics used by legislators to try and avoid, you know, these are timeless American stories, right? Today, we occasionally see, right, legislators fleeing just not too long ago, Oregon legislators trying to flee into Idaho to avoid quorum and taking votes on things. And we see that, and, we're, and I think maybe if we, you know, the, the, histor the historical nature of that, uh, this is the same tactic used in this story, right? And of course, lobbyists very much involved in this process. Uh, part of what was going on uh, in Tennessee was that the liquor lobby was there very actively lobbying legislators in opposition to suffrage, again, because of the concerns about giving women the vote and support of prohibition. And so uh, the continuing struggle for votes, the, succession, the success of the 19th Amendment there in that moment, uh, I love the, the uh, you know, this long, decades long struggle coming down to this quiet moment where they have to stick pins in themselves to almost believe that it had happened. Of course, the 15th Amendment, the 19th Amendment, these don't end the struggle for what we call today universal suffrage in this country. Uh, we would still later have by constitutional uh, uh, mechanism, the 26th Amendment, which would enfranchise nationally 
18 to 21 year olds. That would happen in 1971. And then by regular law, what we call statutory law, many actions that would make the reality of access to the ballot box true for people, including the Civil Rights Act, uh, the 1962 uh, Native American uh, Voting Rights Act would continue to enfranchise people until today, really, where for all intents and purposes, we truly do have universal suffrage in this country, with a few exceptions, uh, most notably, uh, the loss of the right to vote for those who have committed a felony. In some states, those who have um, committed a felony may never get back their voting rights. The Brennan Center for Justice, which tracks voting rights changes and threats to the access to the ballot box, estimates some 6 million people are permanently disenfranchised in this way. Idaho, of course, is a state where one can get their voting rights back after they finish parole and probation. But again, under the 10th Amendment, this is something that is decentralized. So it varies depending on what state you live in. The only other very meaningful way that someone could potentially be disenfranchised, at least temporarily in the United States is if they move near an election. For example, in Idaho, you have to have residency for 30 days here in order to vote. What if you move within 15 days of an election? You are no longer a resident of where you moved from. You're no longer, you're not yet a resident of where you relocated to. But, you know, these are minor things in comparison to the long struggle we had for true legal universal suffrage as it exists today. However, even as we've increased those who are eligible to vote in this country, we've actually seen a decline in those who, uh, a decline percentage wise uh, in participation in voting in our country. Here you see uh, VEP stands for voter eligible population. You see a decline, right? in turnout over time amongst those who are eligible to vote. You see this really high spike here from you know, the mid 1800s into the early 1900s. This is a time period of really strong political machines and political bosses. It's before the standardization of the ballot by nonpartisan government offices. So arguably there was a fair amount during that time period of coercion to encourage people to get out to vote by political bosses, the political machines of their cities. But still, it can't be denied that over time, you know, we've seen declining voter turnout and comparatively to other democratic countries that have universal suffrage, America uh, tends to have quite low voter turnout. In a presidential election year, we generally average around 60% voter eligible population turnout. And in midterm years, usually somewhere between 30 and 40. Though if you're looking at this chart with me, you might note that in 2018, we actually had extraordinarily high voter uh, turnout in that 2018 midterm election with 51%, uh, I think is the exact number, 51% of people turning out, which might speak COVID-19 situation aside, uh, not sure how that might affect things, but at least it seems the spirit of wanting to turn out is uh, alive and well among people right now. But it's not you know, just the story of kind of total you know, amongst the whole population uh, decreased voter turnout. And of course, if we di disaggregate this data, we find that some populations turn out at a much lower rate than others. But one of the lowest turnout populations is, of course, young people, 18 to 25, or even up to 18 to 35, are very low turnout groups. Uh, it also disaggregates along things like wealth, education level, that type of thing. Uh, less education, one of the lowest turnout populations in America is people with less than a high school education, for example. One of the highest turnout groups are those with like PhDs, some 80 plus percent of people with more than a bachelor's level of education turn out to vote. And same with wealth, people who are very wealthy are much more likely to vote than those who are not very wealthy. Suggesting to us that voter turnout is definitely somehow correlated, right, with uh, power uh, and privilege. But uh, women are actually excellent voters. I don't have it right directly in front of you right now, but women actually slightly overrepresent themselves today. Voting, uh, Gerber and Gerber have a great study on voting habits, and that suggests to us that voting is actually a habit building thing. The more you vote, the more you're likely to vote in the future. And maybe that's true generationally as well, because over time, women have become very reliable voters. By the way, if you want to read an excellent book on uh, how women voted in the first few decades after uh, suffrage, I rec rec uh, recommend a book by Wolbrecht called Counting Women's Ballots. It's a good historical look at how women voted in those first few decades after suffrage. And uh, not too big of spoilers, but the big answer is 
it was diverse, it, a huge amount of diversity, much like our elections in this country that are decentralized, voting patterns are deeply decentralized too. It depended on where you lived, all kinds of demographic information, but it's a really interesting read. But while women have been and have become excellent voters over time, some, uh, I think in 2016, 53%, you know, uh, turnout amongst women, uh, and they're like 51% of the population. One place where women do trail is in running for elective office. So we see here, for example, this is in a percent of women who uh, run for the, House, the US House of Representatives. So we see here uh, some discrepancy there. And in fact, in the current Congress, 26% uh, of the Senate, so 26 individuals are women and 23% of the House of Representatives are uh, women. So not even quite parity there uh, with their uh, level in the population. So there's still more to be done in encouraging women to run for office. And also, as you see here, there might be some partisan difference in the ability of the parties to recruit uh, women to office. This is just uh, demonstrating for you here that turnout issue that I was talking about. Women do slightly turn out above uh, men now. So we've learned to vote, but maybe we haven't quite caught on with running for office yet. And it's the same case in state legislatures. It varies by state. So in some states, it's almost cl close to equal representation, men and women. In other states, it is much more similar to the levels that we see in the US Congress. Uh, and then just one last reading, if we're talking about the legacy of voting that I wanna share with you, uh, is about the Equal Rights Amendment. Almost immediately, right, these women who, who had organized the 19th Amendment, uh, who had struggled so long to accomplish this goal, they weren't done. They didn't just dissolve back into the population after they had completed this great goal. They had other goals that they wanted to accomplish. And one of those was the Equal Rights Amendment. Almost immediately, women began organizing to propose the Equal Rights Amendment, which was about more than just voting rights. It meant to create equality for women in things like employment, education, marriage laws, those types of things. And still today, the Equal Rights Amendment was never ratified, though it went through time periods where it, got, it gained momentum, especially in the 1970s. And so for the last reading today, I wanna to share with you about this. Just a moment. Here we go. From uh, one of our education department faculty, Sam Racholm, reading from Shirley Chisholm's uh, speech to Congress upon the introduction of the Equal Rights Amendment for its attempt in the 70s to uh, become part of the Constitution. Shirley Chisholm, August 10th, 1970, Washington, D.C. Mr. Speaker, House Joint Resolution 264, before us today, which provides for equality under the law for both men and women, represents one of the most clear-cut opportunities we are likely to have to declare our faith in the principles that shaped our Constitution. It provides a legal basis for attack of the most subtle, most pervasive, and most institutionalized form of prejudice that exists. Discrimination against women solely on the basis of their sex is so widespread that it seems to many persons normal, natural, 
and right. Legal expression of prejudice on the grounds of religious or political belief has become a minor problem in our society. Prejudice on the basis of race is, at least under systematic attack, there is reason for optimism that it will start to die with the present older generation. It is time we act to assure full equality of opportunity to those citizens who, although in the majority, suffer the restrictions that are commonly Just a minute, minute buffer, buffer, folks. Sorry. sorry. Commonly imposed on minorities to women. The argument that this amendment will not solve the problem of sex discrimination is not relevant. If the argument were used against the Civil Rights Bill, as it has been used in the past, the prejudice that lies behind it would be Hold, Hold tight, tight for, for just a minute, minute and we'll come back, come back to, that to that when it, when it finished, finished, bu finishes, finishes buffering. buffering. In the, in the interim, interim I want you to be able to hear, to hear uh, uh, that, that I would like to just say a couple of things about using that right to vote. Here in front of you, you see IdahoVotes.gov, one of your best sources as an Idahoan for finding out more about your right to vote, whether or not you're registered, where you vote at. It's going to be a very busy election day, I guarantee it, even with uh, the potential increase of uh, ballots being mailed in through our absentee mechanism. And I know there's a lot, I've talked with quite a few folks on campus about absentee slash mail-in ballots. There's a national conversation going on about this. And just to create, to add some clarity to it, Idaho has what we call no excuse absentee balloting. You have to request the ballot to have it sent to you. It's not like our neighbors in Washington or Oregon where the ballot is automatically sent to you and voting is primarily done by mail. They have kind of default mail and uh, mail uh, based elections in uh, Washington, for example. In Idaho, you have to actually request that ballot, which you can do, as you can see here, right on this website. Uh, it's quite easy, uh, but it will be mailed to you, but it's no excuse because you don't have to prove that you'll be out of state uh, in order to get it. Again, remember I said that voting and voting laws are very much state-based. So there are states where you actually have to qualify to get an absentee ballot, like South Carolina, for example, where you have to be essentially active duty military or there's no other way to get a ballot mailed to you. So in Idaho, you don't need to have any specific reason why you want the ballot, you just want it. And when you fill out this request, you could actually request to have either the next election's ballot sent to you or all the upcoming elections for the year, which makes it very convenient. So you can request your absentee ballot there. Uh, that's how it works in Idaho. Idaho also has uh, early voting, which is really excellent. Uh, depending on your county, you could have anywhere between one to four weeks of early voting. So it's important to check your local uh, county's information to know about how long early voting will go on in your county. Uh, and that's a long time, actually. Again, some states have early voting and some don't. Uh, and how early it is can really vary. Again, South Carolina, as an example, has usually a, uh, a one day of early voting the day before the election. We can have anywhere up to four weeks, and that will take place at uh, Twin Falls County West. If you're a Twin Falls resident, that's where the DMV is at, and it'll be from eight to five in those weeks leading up until election day. And then, of course, on election day, you must vote in your precinct. Uh, when you take a look, uh, check your record link here. You can find out where that is. But it's going to be in your neighborhood, right? So don't come to the county building on election day. Make sure you go uh, to the location in your community. It's really easy to get registered to vote in Idaho. As of just a couple of years ago, you can actually register online now, which is really nice. One thing to know, though, is that you can't register online uh, after a certain period in Idaho. That is, once early voting starts, you won't be able to register online. 
you'll have to register when you go to early vote or when you vote on election day. I work uh, as a chief judge in one of our Twin Falls precincts, polling stations, with my students every election day. And lots of times we have people coming in saying, I just registered online, I need to vote. And we're like, doesn't work now. You needed to do that before early voting started. But great news, Idaho is one of less than 10 states that allows you to register to vote on election day. It's great, it's so accessible. What you'll need to do is bring a photo ID and a piece of mail that proves your address in that place where you wanna vote. So it has to again be that local precinct. So it's pretty easy to vote in Idaho. You just need to be registered and know where to vote. And then if you're not registered on the day of the election or during early voting, bring that documentation in and get registered. It's also easy. This is the Twin Falls County election page. It's also easy to know what's on the ballot in Idaho. It's not posted yet, but very soon on this same page, which you can find very easily by going, just Googling Twin Falls County elections, you'll be able to click here on sample ballot and they're not ready yet, but very soon there will be a link that shows you what the ballot will look like. I encourage students to take it, fill it out and bring it in like a cheat sheet when they go vote. So then they know what they plan to do when they get into the ballot box. And then you can see some of the past one here. It's very simple to vote in Twin Falls. You just bubble in next to your choice and then your poll worker will help you out. And in fact, all across the country, there is a shortage of poll workers right now. So one thing you might consider is contacting your county and asking if they need any additional poll workers. So with that, I'd just like to finish by sharing uh, that uh, reading with you. I'll start it over. Shirley Chisholm, August 10th, 1970, Washington, DC. Mr. Speaker, House Joint Resolution 264, before us today, which provides for equality under the law for both men and women, represents one of the most clear-cut opportunities we are likely to have to declare our faith in the principles that shaped our Constitution. It provides a legal basis for attack of the most subtle, most pervasive, and most institutionalized form of prejudice that exists. Discrimination against women, solely on the basis of their sex, is so widespread that it seems to many persons normal, natural, and right. Legal expression of prejudice on the grounds of religious or political belief has become a minor problem in our society. Prejudice on the basis of race is, at least under systematic attack, there is reason for optimism that it will start to die with the present older generation. It is time we act to assure full equality of opportunity to those citizens who, although in the majority, suffer the restrictions that are commonly imposed on minorities to women. The argument that this amendment will not solve the problem of sex discrimination is not relevant. If the argument were used against the Civil Rights Bill, as it has been used in the past, the prejudice that lies behind it would be embarrassing. Of course laws will not eliminate prejudice from the hearts of human beings, but that is no reason to allow prejudice to continue to be enshrined in our laws, to perpetuate injustice through inaction. The amendment is necessary to clarify countless of ambiguities and inconsistencies in our legal system. For instance, the Constitution guarantees due process of law in the 5th and 14th Amendment. But the applicability of due process of sex distinction is not clear. Women are excluded from state colleges and universities. In some states, restrictions are placed on married women who engage in independent business. Women may not be chosen for some juries. Women even receive heavier criminal penalties than men who commit the same crime. What would the legal effects of the Equal Rights Amendment really be? The Equal Rights Amendment would govern only the relationship between the state and its citizens, not relationships between private citizens. The amendment would be largely self-executing, that is, and Federal or state laws in conflict would be ineffective one year after the date of ratification without further action by the Congress or state legislators. 
The time is clearly now to put this house on record for the fullest expression of the equality of opportunity which our founding fathers professed. They professed it, but they did not assure it to their daughters as they did to their sons. The constitution they wrote was designed to protect the rights of white male citizens. There were no black founding fathers and there were no founding mothers. A great pity on both counts. It is not too late to complete the work they left undone. Today, here, we should start to do so. Congress would pass out the Equal Rights Amendment and send it out to the states for ratification, much like they did with the 19th Amendment, but it would not get the necessary number of states to approve it in order to become constitutional law. And still today, it's a, a topic talked about in our society, whether or not the ERA could still be ratified, whether or not the time limit put on its ratification was legal or not. It's popped up in the news in the last couple of years, but certainly the work of full enfranchisement of all members of our society continues. And even when we do get those rights, uh, the constant upkeep of our involvement, our participation, our interest, right, has to be continuously practiced. So with that, I'm so glad you joined me today for Constitution Day at CSI. I hope I'll see you on campus to pick up a copy of the U.S. Constitution. And I, I hope you get out there and vote on November 3rd or send your ballots back in through uh, Idaho's absentee ballot process. It, it, it will surely be a very exciting election in all ways. And if I might wear my state and local government hat, which is my real passion, I certainly encourage you to pay attention, attention to those down ticket races, including for those of us who care and love CSI, a CSI Board of Trustees election that's going on. So I just wanna say thank you to everyone who helped me make this possible, including uh, Alex Daw and, and PR and all the IT support and all those who uh, read from source materials for me in my department chair, Dr. Shelley McEwen. Thank you so much for joining me on Constitution Day. Uh, if you've been to our CSI Constitution Day page, there's some other resources there, including a, a talk and a podcast by the National Constitution Center. They're excellent, I encourage you to check them out. And also not listed there, but easily found, a program recently uh, created by Idaho Public Television. Uh, Idaho Experience has a great program on women's suffrage in Idaho as well that I encourage you to check out. So thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you have a super constitution day. Thank you so much.